Finally, something to look forward to. The first players have been confirmed for this year's Party Poker Moscone Cup, and that's what we're discussing on August's Off the Rail. Hello and welcome to Off The Rail. We're back after a summer break and with us in the studio is Matcha and Multisport MD Emily Fraser. We'll hear from her shortly but first, news this week of course that you've probably seen. The first players have been confirmed for this year's Party Poker Moscone Cup. We'll hear shortly from Alex Laley on Fed or Ghost but first I spoke to Jeremy Jones about having Justin Bergwin back in red for the Stars and Stripes. Jeremy, exciting news this week. Justin Bergman, the first player confirmed for Team USA at the Party Poker Moscone Cup. We've respected the rankings. Justin is top of the rankings. And, and that's kind of vindication of the work he's been putting in, um, certainly towards the end of last year with his performances at the International Open and, and onwards. He, he's really earned this spot. Yeah, he's uh, one hell of a player. I mean, many consider him top three in the U.S. for some time. Um, I think it was good for me and good for me and Joey uh, that he was at the top of the rankings and the way Matchroom and, you know, the pool world was heading back towards those rankings, not only for the Moscone, but being recognized uh, playing pool. Um, I think it was a good deal for Team USA that Justin was on top. Of course, Justin returned to the team after a few years out last year in Las Vegas. He was part of that winning team. You were the vice captain that year. How did Justin fit into the group? Is he sort of a perfect fit for that team? Yeah, he really is, Justin. He's a, some might say he's a quiet guy, unless you really know him. Um, but when he speaks, it's almost always on time. That's exactly what needs to be said, whether it's motivating from a little guy. Like, a, he's, he's kind of pound for pound, the best player in the world, probably. So, um, he's got an incredible mind. He's, uh, he's competed at a high level in, in big tournaments since he was a, a young junior. Um, now, I, I know Justin, he always wants to play as – as well as, as the game will allow. So I think, you know, he didn't play poorly by any means last year, but he sometimes didn't get the opportunities uh, that he wanted. Uh, he certainly wanted to play on the final day, which didn't happen, which is fine because we, we won the cup. Uh, but he, he's doing the right things. He's playing a lot of pool, probably more than any other top player in America uh, right now during this pandemic. So I, I look forward to him to be one of the leaders. And what are his strengths in terms of his pool ability? What's he bringing to the team? Uh, well, very calm. Uh, guy that doesn't really, we always say in pool, if you can play the last two under your speed or the eight ball under your speed, meaning he doesn't vary much. You know, I mean, some guys have really high, high gears and then they fall a lot sometimes. So Justin, he, uh, he's at a great level, but he doesn't really vary a whole lot. So you can depend on him, even if he plays a little bit of a shaky match. You don't expect a, a, him to follow up with another one. And th forgive me, this is a bit of a leading question, but had Justin not taken the automatic spot, I would presume he would have been in your thinking for one of the wild cards in any case. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think uh, no matter what team you, you talk about around the world playing pool, he would be considered. So um, especially, like I said, uh, l last year, the way he ended, and he's continued on playing great pool. He plays a lot of uh, individual matches where he rarely loses, um, and that's high pressure, and I think he's just going to get better and better. And what have you said to Justin? What do you want him to be doing between now and the Moscone Cup in December to be prepared? Well, keep doing what he's doing. We're going to have a one-on-one -on -one training, of course. Uh, he and I mix very, very well. We see things uh, alike a lot on the pool table. Um, you know, we're going to start some team things here in this next week, uh, some some exercise programs along with uh, plenty of time at the pool table. So, you know, the message in him, just keep doing what you're doing. Well, Justin's in as the automatic pick. That leaves you four wild cards for yourself and Joey to choose the rest of the team. Just give us a bit of an idea. How will you be choosing those players? Because, of course, there's no tournaments to judge them on right now. Yeah, well, again, it's going to be a one on one training. Uh, I've got uh, four guys coming in this month. Uh, follow up with uh, three more. Of course, one's going to be already selected, uh, but that won't stop the training by any means. Uh, so we have a small group of seven that are uh, are training together. Now six that will be fighting for four spots. And those those seven guys, or those six guys who are competing for these four spots, just let us know who they are and why you've chosen to be part of this smaller group. 
Well, uh, we of course have uh, the four remaining from last year's team. We can't ignore that that win. Uh, Tyler Steyer, Billy Thorpe, Shane Van Boning, and uh, M- two-time MVP Skylar Woodward. Um, and then we're following it up with Corey Duell and Chris Robinson. Uh, Corey was on plenty of experience and on a winning team just two years ago. And Chris Robinson's been trending in the right direction. He's worked with the team the last couple of years, even though he hasn't made it. Um, I feel like he's, uh, you know, he's always all in, uh, which I certainly appreciate. And it just so happened they fell right there with the rankings as well. So I think it was an obvious choice. Um, it's unfortunate that the pandemic came this year because I think I had messaged Emily that I was I was looking forward to some drama, uh, including a bunch of guys, uh, because we saw a lot of guys going to tournaments, uh, a lot of younger guys going to tournaments with a lot of talent. Um, but it is what it is, and uh, I look forward to it. And during this lockdown period and, and between now and the Moscone Cup itself, what will you be doing in these sessions with these guys, and what are you hoping to see from them in terms of their commitment to the team? Well, um, you know, Joey and I, we put in a lot of discussions on each guy. Um, you know, these are professionals. I mean, uh, we talk about the physical side of the game. There's usually not a whole lot you need there. There are some little things uh, that have really helped the guys over the last couple of years. But uh, I, I think, you know, I'm quite honestly, I'm pretty good at the physical side of the game and fundamentals. But with these guys, my forte really is just a mental approach understanding to play with them themselves and understanding who they are. Um, and, you know, the game's really not about perfect. The game's more about being a player. And uh, so kind of just implementing those thoughts. And there's one last thing I want to ask you about, Jeremy. It's on the other side, of course. Justin Bergman takes Team USA's automatic spot as a qualifier. The world champion takes the spot for Europe, Fed or Ghost. That then leaves four spots for Alex and Carl to choose on Team Europe. It's going to be a very, very strong European team you're going to come up against this year. Um, what do you make of Fedor, and, and do you think it could be the most challenging European team America faced for the last few years? Well, I'm a big fan of Fedor, and uh, and I was very happy he didn't get selected last year. <laughs> First off, uh, in my opinion, I thought if I was on that, that you know, one of those European captains, I, I would have really fought hard to get him on that team. And not take anything away from the other guys that were on the team, of course. Uh, Europe has a solid 15 or 20 that I think could probably make the team. Um, you know, it, yeah, it might be the strongest team ever, but I mean, I'm not too worried about that. To be honest with you, I worry about my guys understanding, uh, you know, they can't do anything when you're at the table. Uh, they, uh, just sit them down as much as you can. Uh, take anything bad that happens, uh, learn from it. Uh, you know, stand tall and, and, and play like an American. Well, Jeremy, awesome to speak to you. Stay safe over there. Good luck with the training counts. We look forward to seeing a little bit of what's going on in there. I'm sure we'll speak to you plenty of times over the next few weeks. But, Jeremy, for now, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Nick. Y'all stay safe and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Exciting to see who Jeremy Jones might be choosing to join on Team USA. Those announcements over the next few weeks across our social media pages. Emily, Jeremy was talking there about the rankings. Of course, we'd hoped to have two players join Team USA from the rankings this year, but given the situation, that wasn't possible. But it was important for ourselves at Matrim and for the captains to respect those rankings. Yeah, of course. And we've been looking at that for so long to include the rankings, especially for Team USA, who's been wild cards for so long or captain's picks. And uh, finally, to find something throughout the year similar to Europe, and then all of a sudden this happens... um, but we won't get too bogged down about it. And we obviously want to respect the players who earned some of those ranking points um, from when we announced it. And rightly so. Our first announcements to have someone like Justin Bergman on the team who earned his right to be there um, this December. So it's great to be able to incorporate that. Listening to Jeremy um, and hearing his thoughts that he has now for the rest of the year is quite interesting. I think most people would look at Team USA and say, okay, they've won two years in a row. Why not bring back 2019's winning team? Um, But he's now brought Corey and just and uh, Chris Robinson into the mix, and you're going, okay, so who's the one who's not in contention? Basically, so you've got, you've obviously got Justin Bergman who's in there now. You're gonna go for Shane, and then then you've got the MVP Skyler, but he's just had a baby. What sort of shape is he in at the moment? 
Then you've got Billy Thorpe. How's he playing? Then you've got Tyler. So who's he going to take out for potentially Corey or Chris? Is it both Corey and Chris? Or is it just one of them? Or is he just toying with them and he's just going to pick the winning team? I'm going to say I don't know. No, I don't know actually what he's thinking, to be honest. But I do think it's great that he's brought these seven into the mix and he's actually being upfront. He's honest with them. He's saying, look, this is what the plan is. Everyone comes with me, we train, and he's going to pick them based on how they're training. There's no events happening on the calendar right now. And rightly so, one from the rankings, which has now been confirmed, and the four are captain picks. And um, Jeremy's going to have an, an interesting pick on his hand, uh, him and Joey. I think they're both going to be training with uh, those other players. And I guess it's just they're going to see who's going to be best in that Moscone Cup arena which is, of course, going to be very different this year. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Same process, though, for Team Europe. Alex Lay takes Fedor Gorst off the rankings. We'll hear from Alex in a moment. And then him and Carl have got four players to choose, which sounds like a great luxury if you're a European captain. But when you think of how many top European players there are, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes right now. No, and no disrespect to Team USA, but Team Europe, you feel like you've got better players to kind of pick from, and it makes that, that decision even harder. Um, but then also, you know, they've lost last two years. You've got Alex Laley coming in as the new captain. He's obviously, he's won one, lost one. So now it's his third time going. So he's going to be looking at this and saying, you know, I've got a point to prove here and I want to win. He's obviously going to try and pick his strongest team. You've got Carl Boys there, who's obviously very knowledgeable on the format, knows all of these players. He knows what the Moscone is like now. I think a lot of people forget what it's like these last couple of years um, and how it's changed. There's a lot more production, there's a lot more pressure. Um, so they're going to have a tough one on their hands. I mean, I've got my five who I would pick, but uh, it's not down to me at the end of the day. It is down to those two. And it's great. They both talk to each other. I know that Alex is really keen to speak with the players a lot. And I know he's been communicating with a lot of them throughout lockdown. And he's obviously very big on his coaching game and mentally and things like that and it's great that he's been communicating with them and I think the main aim that we've been even trying to do here at Matchroom is just to be as transparent as possible and that's what he's been doing with his players but it'll be interesting to see who comes out with obviously his rankings is Fedor rightly so he's the world champion um, so that'll be that'll be an interesting one he is the world champion he's also a rookie for Team Europe and earlier this week I spoke to Alex Laley about Fedor Gost. Alex, very good to see you. Of course, this week we've announced the first player for Team Europe is Fedor Gorst. He's the world champion, so of course, a very strong player to join Team Europe. Yeah, I'm happy to have him on board. I mean, he, I think he came close to making the team last year, uh, but he would have been a debutant, but he could have been a world star. There were plenty of people who thought he, he was the man to put in there, but I'm happy to have him on board. You know, he's young, he's... He's more than a talent. He's now a proven champion. And he's, very, he's a smart guy, he's a sociable guy, and he's very coachable. So for Carl and me, you know, it's, it's perfect to have him, have him in there. And Alex, is Fedor the kind of player that you feel both as a player and a personality will fit very well into what you want from the team dynamic? Yeah, definitely, definitely. He's not... Uh, He's not individualistic. Well, of course he is because he's a pool champion. So, you know, he has that focus, but he's also as a person and how he has grown as a player, he has learned to to be open for input and feedback. And he, he won't shy away if he feels it's up to him to tell someone uh, or help to, to give, give, give other players feedback. He's just a stand-up guy. And I mean, he's really... Uh, he's really mature for his age, on and off the table. We've already spoken to Fedor this week and he said you've had some conversations and given him some things to work on. What kind of insight can you give us there? What have you been speaking to Fedor about? Uh, well, there's, you know, there's some things I always try and check with the players if it's, uh, you know, how receptive they are, but with Fedor, He's just firing away. You know, I have a lot of knowledge and he, he's also asking many questions. So it's more with him. It's more sometimes that I feel the need to slow him down because he's so hungry for knowledge. And, uh, you know, a, a bit, actually, it's most technical. And we haven't 
we didn't get into shot selection and tactics and all that. But um, so mainly technical. Uh, it must be quite difficult for you as a coach in the current situation because, of course, usually you would see players at tournaments and for training, but with the travel restrictions around Europe at the moment, that's not possible for you. So how are you finding ways around that? Well, it's very difficult, as you say. Uh, we're limited to see the players in action, although many of the top players in Europe are uh, entering these, these challenges, ghost formats, etc. Um I'll try to keep in contact with some of the usual suspects, some, some of, you know, your, the usual suspects, so the first ones you think about when thinking about Team Europe. Um, so I'll keep in contact, but it's not like, it's not the, the dreamt of scenario like right now. I mean, I would rather see them in action in the States, in Asia and in Europe and getting a real feel for where their form is. So. So there's a lot of uh, guesstimation at the moment, but we'll try to keep uh, uh, as good a contact with the players as we can, Carl and I. So how are you going to go about these last four players? Because this year you've now got four wild cards rather than just two, but it must be very difficult to make those decisions, as you say, without them traveling around the world playing tournaments. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll have to go more by gut feeling than than the scenario was before because we had uh, uh, two wild cards and three through the rankings. Um, all players are informed that that matchroom and we that we have let go the initial uh, format, and we can't we can't test the players. They're, you know we're in August. They're not playing now. They won't be playing next month. They won't be playing probably the month af after. So. So it's very difficult and what will weigh more than what was planned is how they have performed in the matchroom arena before. So uh, this will be a disadvantage to, to players who try to make the team, but you know, we can only go, Carl and I can only go by the results that we've seen this year and previous years. And of course, like you say, you've not been able to speak to any of the or see any of the players. But of course, also, you've not been able to see Cole Boys since he became the vice captain. But how much have you, be, you two been speaking during this period? Yeah, well, we're, we're on the phone a lot. We're just, you know, uh, um, sharing information, sharing views. He, he's been doing a lot of homework on previous Moscone Cups. Um, I'm, I'm, I've scheduled some Skype trainings with a couple of the players. Uh, talking to some of the players uh, and the more players are known the more collective we can make those sessions because as we're still you know as long as we're going to be at home we can still do some work do some skype or zoom collective trainings group talks you know we can just like anyone that had to work from home with a with a normal job we can do the same thing we'll find we'll find solutions to get together to get that information out um, and to get to know each, on, each other better. Well, Alex, some big decisions coming up over the next few weeks. I'm sure we'll speak to you plenty more times between now and then. But for now, thank you very much and stay safe and we'll see you soon. Uh, stay safe, Nick. And of course, many more players to be confirmed for Team Europe and Team USA over the next few weeks. But one thing that's not yet confirmed that we're not sure of, Emily, is the situation. Of course, everything's changing, everything's evolving. We've said and we'll say again, we're absolutely committed to doing the Moscone Cup as close to normal as possible, as best as possible. But at the moment, it's, there's so many options on the table. It's just, you just don't know. You can wake up one day and, have, and be totally confident in one option. And things can change in a matter of 24 hours. We've just seen it recently this week um, with the World Snooker Championship. I was there in Sheffield myself and we were with um, you know, our government officials and we got told, look, as of tomorrow, uh, they're not going to pilot any spectators um, for the events. And that was a huge step for us when they announced that they would be pilot piloting these, um, these live sporting events. Because for us, for the Moscone, we were going, OK, this is great. We can see how they're doing it. Let's see how we can do it for our event in December. So, like I said, in a matter of 24 hours, that all changed. Um, but we won't lose faith. We're very, very hopeful and confident that the Moscone will take place. Obviously, a lot of it depends on international um, athletes coming into the country. 
Again, we're in discussions with the government. We're trying to work as to how they come in, whether they go into a bubble, um, into their isolation, they get tested. We've, we've achieved Championship League, which was in June, our snooker event. We did a full lockdown process and we absolutely nailed it. Something that we have no idea about this COVID. Um, and then we've got Fishermania coming up next, which we're not testing for. So I feel like we're getting experience into what's happening. Um, we're in August. We've obviously got December coming up. We're looking at options for the arena. Obviously, at the moment, we've got 3,000 spectators sitting at Alexandra Palace. Now, we're not going to be silly about it. We need to be realistic. Are we going to be allowed to have 3,000 spectators? We don't know right now. And that is the main point. But what we are doing is we are looking at every single option. We're trying to be creative as to perhaps we can change the arena design. What we want, we don't want it to be closed doors, behind closed doors. If it needs to be behind closed doors for the event to happen, then so be it. But we don't want that to be the case. So we need to look at new ways in order to get spectators in there. We're obviously very conscious that people have booked travel. They've obviously booked their hotels. We want to get the message out there as soon as possible but we don't want to get it out there too soon. Um, we want to make sure that we know exactly what we're doing. And we just want to, we want everyone to be there. And we're working so hard to obviously make it happen. And whatever happens, it will be a fantastic event. So December the 1st, it, it will be there. It's exciting to have some players announced this week and start building towards that. It'll be a fantastic end to the year. A, a word quickly on some of the other events this week, of course, some bad news as well. No US Open this year. Yeah, I always like to sandwich good news and bad news. So it's great news that the Moscone Cup players will be announced, but obviously um, with the US Open being cancelled, it was, it was a matter of time sort of thing. Um, obviously with it being over in, in America, it's st straight away just causes a lot of trouble for us. We're obviously, we're based here in the UK. Um, we're in talks with the government officials here, so we have a lot more control when the event is here. Like the World Pool Championship, maybe let's keep it here in the UK. Um, with the US Open, it's 256 players. It's a six-day event. What's the likelihood of us getting all of those players in a venue in Las Vegas before December? It's just very unlikely. There's no venue availability. It's just, it's just impossible, to be completely honest with you. So the best thing for the US Open is to cancel the event. All 256 players get their money back, regardless of how they entered. And let's start fresh. So we're still, we're not going anywhere. We're, you know, we're, we're matching. We're not, we're not rushing off anywhere. Let's just get, off, get, get things straight. Start off in 2021. Let's open it up again to 256. The worst thing would have been if we continue this event and half the field, we're just all of a sudden taking a step back, whereas that's not what we're doing. We want to keep pushing, keep pushing the prize money and keep pushing the event to make it bigger and to make it better. So again, I know there's no live events happening right now. Um, and it's obviously, it's tough for the pool players, it's tough for spectators, but it also gives us an opportunity to look at other areas that where we could potentially look at new events. Um, we're obviously trying to look at the World Pool Championship. So let's just give us a bit of time. Let's do things properly and let's do it right. There's no point in rushing into things. You know, we don't have to be in Las Vegas next year. Could open the door to something completely new just because we've waited and we find the right time to do it. We are trying to look at May. Um, we obviously, we have a promoters discussion with all of the pool promoters in the industry where we all talk about our dates, which was one of the best things that I would say we created, Matchroom, I created it. So we did it here so we didn't clash with anyone else because we don't want to be clashing with anyone. You know, we want to make sure that we are working with everyone, that the players have different events they can go to back to back and there's not things clashing and stuff like that. So it's fantastic we've done that. We're looking for May, so we're not clashing with anyone else. Um, but we're going to see what happens. It's tough for availability. It really is tough, but we need to make sure we can get all of our team there, we can get all 256 players there, and we can also produce it to the standard that we normally do. You mentioned the World Pool Championships a couple of times there. That's currently scheduled for the start of January. That's getting closer and closer. What's the latest on that? Yeah, I can feel myself sweating when you say it's in January. But 
I mean, it is what it is. Again, we need to get 128 players into the UK. We're even looking at for the Moscone Cup and our Weber Cup that's coming up for the US players coming in. Obviously, there's an exemption on international athletes that are coming into the UK. Um, that is something that we can apply for January. But again, we, the World Pool Championship, it should be the best players in the world, not just 50 of them and then the other 50 or, or so that can get here. Shouldn't be that, especially our first year back. So I'll go back to my point that let's not rush this. We're not going anywhere. The World Pool Championship, it's not like it was before. We're going to take it a few years and then we're going to step back and go, yeah, we don't want that anymore because it costs too much money. So we're in it for the long haul. So let's find a time that is right for it. And let, if it means we have to move the dates, then we'll move the dates. Well, look, keep following Matchroom Pool across social media for all the latest updates on all of our events. And Emily, on the subject of social media, I know you've got a little message for the players. <laughs> I do. And do you know, it's been driving me bloody crazy for so long. We work in so many different sports and we obviously come across so many different athletes. I'm not saying pool, are the, pool players are the worst ones, but... We work in sports where they're so professional and one thing that we're trying to do at Matchroom is to professionalise pool and pool players. And it just seems to me that everything at the end of the day is all about how many Facebook friends you've got. And not everything revolves around Facebook. We're proving this with YouTube, there's Twitter. I don't even think half the pool players know what Twitter is. Do you? Like, they don't. I, I think if you actually did a poll, they probably don't know what Twitter is. Probably don't, don't have never even been on there. But we do our snooker events and boxing was at the weekend. Boxing was, I'm saying it to the players here, boxing was the number one trending on Twitter for fight camp. We would never have that for the Moscone Cup because none of our players are active on social media accounts like that. All they do is they accept their friend requests and they, get to, they reach the 5,000 on Facebook. And I don't know, half of them are posting raffles or things like that. And it's just so, we're just... We're trying to take this sport to the next level. I just feel every time we look at this stuff, it's a step back. There's no professional accounts on Instagram. It's just, everyone just needs to wake up because we're in a perfect time right now. No one's bloody doing anything. So get on your phone. It's not difficult. If I can do it, like so, so can they. So get on your phone, set up a Twitter account, set up an Instagram account. Set up an actual proper Facebook account. Not your f friends where you, you, know, you go to your mum's birthday and you're there around the table with a cake and stuff. I don't know. Well, obviously, we all go out and celebrate and we do things and people want to know what you're up to on a day-to-day -day basis. But pool players will never get to the celebrity status if they keep doing what they're doing. Obviously, look at Shane. He, is, he has the highest followings on social media. He's got no Instagram account. He's, I think he's got a fake one. So all we're trying to do is promote this sport. We're trying to market our events, but it's basically like we're just working as a solo team here. We don't have any key promoters to go up against. So it's just, fortunately enough, we all really like our jobs and we all actually enjoy what we're doing. Otherwise, this sport would just be absolutely in the ground because the players aren't doing it. And, they're, and okay, I'm probably generalizing it a bit there are a few that are outstanding you get your josh filler which probably Pia filler does it for him um, you get jason shaw catchy's probably good on things like instagram and they're professionalizing it people look up to these players they don't want to see a facebook live of you out smashed or pissed they want to see actual posts of you training or what you're doing as part of your game so this is the prime time to get on your social media accounts and to actually step up. Because I'm saying it now, we will not be inviting these sort of players into our events that are not in it with us. Because at the end of the day, it's all about social media and digital media. They are not on it with us. You're not in our events. Well, I think that's the message you heard <laughs> loud and clear. And if you want more of that, Emily, Joey, Gray and Carl Boys are back with myself for Loose Pool, our podcast, which returns next week. But in the meantime, that's all for Off The Rail. I'm off to go and follow Shane Van Boning on TikTok <laughs> and we'll see you again soon.